You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 7th, 2018, a day that will live in infamy. It's not safe for work. This is recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where Ann Coulter's column today, No Kidding, in our local paper, syndicated, was entitled, Willie Horton ad was Bush's finest moment. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. show is brought to you by our new presenting sponsor marvel comics tariff man and the wasps tariff man and the you wasps know, <laughs> leaping a crashing stock market yes well this in it, a single tweet literally it it, it, it uh, this would not have been possible our new presenting sponsor would not have been able to put this movie together uh this week had not donald trump declared himself tariff man and had not ross do written a column about Oh, where have all the good wasps gone? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I did a little research. Uh, the um, Ross Duthat column about how in the good old days of George H. W. Bush, we had wasps ruling the country, and in our meritocratic system, uh, neither rule as wisely nor as well is virtually identical to the same David Brooks column that was written, I believe. Nine years, eight years ago, in 2010, with literally the same language, meritocratic elites uh, have failed us. It was much better in the good old days when the power elites, a bunch of wasps were running things. This is just what the New York Times does. Can we talk about the fact that David Brooks, I don't want to go full Louis Gohmert here, but David Brooks is Jewish and Roth Duthat is a Catholic. Yes. And neither one of them would have been accepted in George H.W. Bush's private prep school. But they aspire to be. <laughs> they, they, here's, and this is the thing that Ross Douthat and David Brooks and let's face it, right down the line, Brett Stevens, um, Michael Gerson, just right down the line. These are all people who had their noses pressed up against the power elite window their whole lives. These are people who were who craved to be part of the William Buckley inner circle. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. they, they have reshaped their lives. Um, Mm -hmm. David Brooks famously said that his, in his family, uh, it was, uh, what was it? Think Yiddish act British Mm. was his like family motto. Uh, These are people who, who, who have been horny from a very young age to be a snobby, Boston Brahmin elite mm-hmm. and have shaped their entire life and their entire ideology around the idea that that's the ideal. That's the perfect system. The perfect system for running this country is to have George H.W. Bush run it uh, in the manner of noblesse oblige, in the manner of royalty or monarchy or entitled wasps who went to entitled schools. And it, it would just be um, Downton Abbey. You'd have, you know, you have a very privileged entitled family running the estate You'd have hot and cold running help who all do their place and everything would run very smoothly. And that's how the country should be run, which t- complete. This is the, this was the, one of the big stories this week. It was the, the degree to which the media collectively ignored the entire history of the first Bush administration, right. how George Bush won, how he left office, all the mistakes he made as a president and as an up and coming politician and everything that his administration and those before it set in motion that turned the Republican Party into the party of Trump. And the those only person were, that I saw talking about that in those terms was Charlie Pierce. Yes, and that was my favorite matchup in the last week. <laughs> it really was. Because Charlie Pierce went on I, the Chris Hayes' show mm-hmm. to right. talk about the actual um, plain black and white history of the George H.W. administration. And Jennifer Rubin wanted, <laughs> suddenly turned into uh, Cloris Leachman. Yeah, he was my boyfriend. Don't talk about him. He was my boyfriend. He was the greatest president who ever lived. You son of a bitch! And <laughs> it was just out. Of, and this, Jennifer Rubin has very carefully cultivated a uh, persona as a never Trumper. Uh, well, the she's, Party- she's she's better than a lot of them because she actually said, "Elect Democrats, right? You know, 
we've got to flip the Congress in order right. to deal with this monster. And so she said, and no sugarcoating it. To her credit, she said, I, I was wrong. I, I, I knew these people were in my party. I had no idea they were there in such profusion. Um, I ignored them. We all ignored them. This was just some fringe group. We never realized that this fuck is, this is my party. Yeah. Holy shit. How do we fix this? But mm -hmm. man, you take it back to the, the last president for whom any Republican has any sense of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. The good old, the, not any Republican. That's not fair because they all revere St. Ronald Reagan. The, the right. fictional Reagan is the greatest president who ever lived. The right. actual Reagan was a disaster, but fictional mm -hmm. Reagan is the one that they all light little votive candles to every day of their lives. But the one that all the William Buckley wannabes, all mm -hmm. the power elites in Washington light their candles to in, in, in an alternate version of reality is George H. W. Bush, as they wished him to be, as they mm -hmm. as they remember him to be, and the minute Charlie Pierce started bringing receipts to the table, she freaked out. Yes, she she did. was having none of it. No, he was a great man. Shut your hole, you Irish scumbag! And it was like, oh, this is this is Jennifer Rubin I've known for years. This is the yeah, original right. Jennifer Rubin. Right. This is the one who's not going to hear any shit from anybody about her party and. It's a helpful reminder that even among the best never Trumpers, it's like um, chronic disease that never goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's right below the skin, and man, you find you find just the right stick to poke it with, and that old defensive, you liberal scum, don't you dare talk about the greatest president who will ever live that way, comes right out of the box. Yeah, and I this week the the funeral and the national day of mourning and yeah. the remembrances and all the. Dick Cheney and his cabal coming yes. out of the woodwork to talk, including Carl Rowe, to talk yeah. about their fond, fond memories of this great gentleman. Uh -huh. uh, it was a rebuke to Trump's narcissism. Yes. It was yeah. not a rebuke to Washington, D.C.'s narcissism. No, no. It was a total confirmation of the Georgetown chardonnay sipping let's go to a party and celebrate each other's book release what what digby calls the village yeah that villager narcissism is still in full existence and it showed itself this week that oh, yeah. whole you know oh you know there was a kinder gentler time when things were everyone was civil to one another well that's sure. bullshit yeah exactly it's, yeah. it's bullshit this week really was sort of the the gears of the of the memory hole seizing up. Yes, because right. It, right. it forced people who have spent uh, literally their entire career at this point—I mean, twenty five years—forgetting uh -huh. the past, right. erasing the past, whitewashing the past, pretending the past never happened. George W. Bush never happened. Uh, the Obama administration never happened. Uh, it forced them to go back to a time uh, and begin the timeline at a period that they have spent their entire career forgetting. Right, right. And they have built themselves such an incredible carapace of false memories around what the country used to be like that any – and it's so thin, it's so brittle, it can't tolerate any, any scrutiny. Yeah. So yeah. the idea that, well, remember back in the old days, this is like – it's all sepia-toned and it's all a little bit weepy and nostalgic for the good old days. You know, what a civil, decent man – who had a great family and cared about his community could rise to be president. I'm like, yeah, we had that a minute ago. It was Barack Obama. George H.W. Bush caved to the far right of his party for votes over and over again. You know, the Willie Horton ad, as you say, yep. the idea that, boy, Ann Coulter is desperate for attention. That's the last time I'm going to mention her name on this podcast. She is so desperate for attention that she'll say the worst it's not just the worst thing in the H.W. Bush administration. It's the worst ad, political ad ever on television. Yeah. And uh, she has to praise it in order to get attention. So uh, and and he said yes to that. He signed he off did. on that. Yes, he did. Uh, and what Charlie Pierce said, the point that Charlie Pierce was making is George H.W. Bush paved the way for Trump. He did. And he absolutely did. That that is just a fact. And and yes, Jennifer Rubin couldn't handle it. We need to and, move on. Well, uh, and all the people who look the other way, too. Um, if I could just read, there's a terrific description of access journalism I have in our notes from Splinter. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is this is the entire village. This is the entire Beltway media. This is how they operate. This is why you can go on a straight line from really Nixon 
uh, through Reagan and both Bushes all the way to now. And the people, every time an administration flips, every time there's a Republican atrocity, they just pretend it doesn't happen mm-hmm. or it's not really bad or Democrats are just as bad. And they and they don't want to look in the rearview mirror because the rearview mirror is where all the bodies are. It's where they made their career on sucking up to horrible people. And now they're in positions of relative authority and they don't want anybody messing with their their cocktail parties. So uh, there's a wonderful article on the death of access journalism, why access journalism journalism must die in splinter uh, from splinter. And the uh, there's just one paragraph I thought I'd share with our listeners. Mm -hmm. Access journalism isn't just promising a subject of a puff piece in return for access. It can be much more subtle than that. If you're really good at it, uh, your subjects won't even have to ask if your piece will be gentle with them because they know it will. Access journalism, as Leah Finnegan wrote in the outline, is also, quote, not only believing people in power, but protecting their identities even when they are wrong or lying. It's not even asking the question because you know it might disrupt future coverage. It's going to off-the-record parties with sources, chumming it up, and posting your selfies with them on Instagram. Now, this is back to just drift glass talking. That is a perfect description of how Meet the Press operates and how right. Face the Nation operates right. and how most of cable news operates. The, the idea that Chuck Todd knows that people are lying to him, mm-hmm. knows that the people who he finds on his show, especially Republicans, lie to him all the time, knows that contributors to MSNBC and NBC lie all the time, know that people are, are sourcing uh, other people who are lying, and everyone knows it. Everyone knows that they're lying. And they still get access to public platforms that you and I will never have access to with millions of people who don't know they're being lied to because it's worth it to advance Chuck Todd's career and not just him, but all the rest of them to put liars on the air to make them comfortable. Not to, and that's Washington runs on that. Right. And this that explains your question that you've had multiple times on this podcast about mm-hmm. Hugh Hewitt. Yes. The, the paragraph you read. They know that Hugh Hewitt's never going to ask a tough question of a Republican. They know that well in advance. He is. That's why he has the Rolodex he has. So, uh, yeah, no, that's exactly right. And the access journalism this week of Dick Cheney and Karl Rove can all come out. And because they know the questions are going to be. So exactly how wonderful was George H.W. Bush? And that's it. That's going to be. And and there is there is respect for the dead, and that I understand you don't shit on somebody during their funeral, right. but you don't totally delete someone's past, and especially historical figures and presidents. And and I've been listening, and you and I talked about this last night. And there are there is a pronounced type of stutter almost that you hear that Eugene Robinson has, and Charlie Pierce has it sometimes, and Chris Hayes has it quite often when they're talking about this subject. And I'm convinced that it's just this kind of reaction to their their brain trying to avoid any mention of a topic that will make their guest mad, while at the same time talking about what really happened. Mm-hmm. And you end up with them having to do this kind of halting, weird, elliptical, tangential way of referring to the past, because if they just come out and said, look, you fuckers knew these people were bad. They've been bad for 30 years. Everyone around this table knows they're a bunch of goddamn criminals. And the reason we have Donald Trump as president is because your party is a shithole. It's been a shithole for 30 years. Every one of you knows it. Every one of you made your living pandering to these people. Quit lying about it. Let's get on with the business of cleaning up your mess. But that's the story, which is clear and plain and true, that is never going to be told by anyone anywhere. It's that one conversation that nobody wants to have in public because it, it will destroy too many friendships, too much access to people in power. Um, all of your contacts would dry up within the media and people would be out of work. Lots of people will be out of work. So You mean like it, Michael Gerson? Yes, like Michael <laughs> Michael Gerson. Oh, please, don't get me started. Okay, get me started. Just a little bit. Just pull that a little bit. Today, Michael Gerson uh, went up upon his cross uh, <laughs> and, and nailed himself to it and said, I was so naive. All the years I was in the Republican Party, I never realized it was full of Republicans. How could I have been so naive? Now, naive isn't the word I would use. Uh, I would use a whole bunch of different words. Uh, But that's the story. That's the lie they're all going to stick to. But they're all waking up because they've had a really bad week in the stock market. Their portfolios are bad, and that's what's snapping them out of this. I'm absolutely convinced. Uh, Fox had to apologize 
for Louis Gohmert. Go, I mentioned that earlier. Louis Gohmert saying, well, you know, I don't think that that George Soros is a very good Jew, do you? Yeah. <laughs> on Fox Business. And they went on for almost an hour after that before they apologized. But somebody upstairs made a call and yeah. said, you got to de- renounce that statement. Uh, it was very Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you reminded me of this. Ma- Mary Hartman had the country singer on uh, the Dinah Shore show and talking about how, uh, you know, your producer is so nice. He showed me how to chit chat with you and the topics we should cover. And he was just so kind and wonderful. I had no idea his was the people that killed our Lord. <laughs> And, of course, they shut down the show at that point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is this is not representative of the show, the network, or the United States of no. America. <laughs> well, not yet. Not yet. No. And, I, you this- know, like I say, I think the Republican Party is pretty clear that they're perfectly okay with Louis Gohmert representing their view. Yeah. Well, and um, the problem that, that previous administrations have, have made is they overreach. They, they move too yeah. quickly. Yeah. They they didn't slowly poison the public well, and but I, that's that's what Donald Trump has done. He's lurched that Overton window so far to the right yeah. that now uh, Bill Crystal is the reasonable center of our political conversation, Same. and liberals have ceased to exist in anywhere in any discussion on any platform ab- about anything. And that's that's he's their dream come true because yeah he's he's a he, they can sacrifice him they can burn him they can, they're gonna turn around in a week or a month or a year and say they never they never had any confidence in him they never believed him uh, it was a bunch of crazy fringes and it wasn't us it was some intern somewhere well and they'll blame the bunch- is already speaking to a, a swiss uh news weekly this uh-huh. morning it came out on in the washington post uh i said well you know he thought that Swiss Ger- the Nazis don't read Swiss German, so it's okay. But uh, basically saying Donald Trump's a failure. And he had three promises. He was going to defund Planned Parenthood, uh, reverse Obamacare, and build the wall. He's done nothing because he doesn't mm-hmm. know how. And <laughs> for Tucker Carlson to say that out loud, as I said, he said it overseas to a foreign yeah. language publication. So... He feels safe doing that with his audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he had a bad week in the market. And uh, all of the Fox News millionaires on air talent had a bad week in the market and Mm -hmm. are noticing that it's not going to be 4% growth forever. That tax cut lie is has run out earlier than they thought it would. When it hits you personally and hits your stock market portfolio personally, I think that's when uh, people start reversing their course and looking for a scapegoat, which well, is one. One of the most important parts of running a scam mm-hmm. is folding the scam when it's over. Be, and getting out you know, of there. And right. getting out. Three I mean, the whole money like, has to leave the alley. Before- yeah, you got to go. Get off you Get off the train car. Get another bunch of suckers. And they their scam is now busted, and it's in the open, and everyone can see what's and it's happening. it's on tape. It's on camera. And, and, and their, their opponent is our liberals who have the superpower of memory. Yeah. Yeah, and, and now there's – and they're, the guy who's been running their scam, who's now basically walking around with his pants off, pissing himself all day long, is the president of the United States. Right. who won't shut and up. They're, they're, <laughs> and who won't shut up, and who's, who, yeah. they're looking at two more years staring down the barrel of that. Right. And right. it is, in a weird way, like the Bush recession in in that the, the recession hw bush recession or the 2008 w's because there are w's two. the great recession <laughs> yes there, there certainly are the great recession i truly believe was scheduled to occur when barack obama was president right, right. the idea was uh, we're going to blow the, the housing market up we're going to leech every nickel we can we're going to leave this burning bag of dog shit on on barack obama's desk and leave town and suddenly the economy is going to explode and it's the scary black guy from chicago that ruined the world economy and it just all went south too soon. And that's the problem with Trump. He won. Mm-hmm. The, the whole game was we'll scam and we'll scam and we'll scam and we'll make a ton of money. He'll make a ton of money. He'll get his tower in Russia. Nobody will care. He'll get a job on Fox. Nobody will care. And we'll have Hillary Clinton to just flog for four years for every one of our problems and failures. We'll have another Barack Obama that we can blame for all of our sins, load everything on her back and, and burn her like a witch every day of the right. week. Right. But but that didn't it didn't work that way. And now they're stuck with, again, the guy who's been running their the guy who ran their scam is is senile. 
and crazy and racist and walking around with his pants off. Mm -hmm. And they can't stop him. And they can't pretend they didn't know. And they can't pretend they didn't care. And they can't pretend they didn't vote for him. So now they're come, now they're they're revving up the Bush off machine. I swear to God that the, the minute he's gone one way or another, they're all going to pretend they were independents. They were centrists. They didn't know anything about it. It wasn't their fault. They'll find some fucking scapegoat out there and the media will go right along with the scam because mm -hmm. their jobs depend on this shit, too. Right, right. So speaking of which, shall we move on to uh, Milo? Ilianopolis and Laura Loomer, or do you want to skip over no, that stuff? Let's let's do that because Milo is bragging about how broke he is. <laughs> he's super broke. He's not just broke. He's super. The number broke. two million dollars came out, and he went, "No, I'm more broke than that. I owe more than that. Don't don't yeah. minimize my debt. I'm important, don't you know?" Yeah. And uh, yeah. his was... his uh, Patreon page lasted less than twenty four hours because Patreon doesn't want to be associated with that. With Nazis. <laughs> Turns out there are lines in the sand that people don't cross. Right. Laura Loomer, this was the week that Laura Loomer handcuffed herself to our Hard parts. to believe. It seems like a year uh, ago, but. Yeah, no, it was this week. And this was the week that Tumblr decided to go out of business, which I thought was very interesting. No, they didn't. Uh, they just decided problem. they're yeah. not going to broadcast porn anymore. Yeah. So, like I said, they decided to go out of business. <laughs> and uh, that's fine. Uh, if you want puppies and kittens and flowers, that's what Etsy's ads are for. But. Um, so Tumblr, that's fine. They, they, it's a private company, and that's sort of where we're going with this. Twitter decided that there is a line they don't cross, which is the Alex Jones right, line. Right, right. And, and and the Weekly Standard is going to be uh, strip mined, and Glenn Beck and Mark Levin. You know, Mark Levin, the intellectual of the conservative movement. Mark Levin. He's the smart one. Yeah, is, <laughs> he's like the Kate. Kate. He's like the Kate Jackson. Uh, you know, he's I'm, the I'm smart Charlie's one. Angel. Charlie's Angel. <laughs> yeah, he's the smart one. <laughs> they they teamed up with uh, Nazis and lunatics to start their own wingnut website for people who think Fox News is too masterpiece theater. Yeah, you know because that Shep, I can't stand him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he misses up my midday. I'm in there getting a good hate on, got a good hate boner going. He comes on like, oh, it's like ice water down my pants. But I do think so, I do think there is some sort of I don't know know if I call it maturing or just kind of exhaustion in social media where. You and I did have a long discussion about this last night. Thank you for taking me out to dinner, by the way. That was very nice. Date. We go was, to a restaurant a wonderful time. that has Thrifty Thursday, and they have a low-cost uh -huh. uh, entree, and we go and have that, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but we're talking about how all of a sudden there are community standards in these yeah. private businesses that are social media enterprises. Uh, you didn't mention Pornhub, Drift Glass. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I figured, I figured you remember that, but I did want you to talk about the, uh, the shopping right. mall well, analogy. And, and Pornhub, by the way, has banned Starbucks coffee from their offices because Starbucks is no longer allowing people to stream porn at their coffee shop. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there was a court case a number of years ago about whether or not uh, shopping malls had the ability to stop people in the hallways of their malls, not in stores, but actually in the uh, through affairs of shopping malls, stop people from leafleting or uh, somehow spreading a political message or getting out information. So having a, a table or a booth or some leafleting or, or vote for so-and-so or doing any kind of sort of public communication effort in a public, in a privately owned mall, but a public space uh, was that something that a mall owner could stop? And uh, the court at that time, uh, you know, conservative court said, yes, the private ownership of the mall trumps public communication. Yeah. And that was very chilling at the time because there was no social media and it was considered that this really stops free speech in America because a lot of Americans are not out on the sidewalk ever. They go to the mall to shop. No, the idea that people gather in the public park and listen to people on orange crates no, is don't. a quaint idea, but they don't they do don't that do anymore. That. They just right. don't. And how are, how are people going to get messages out that, that actually matter to society and having a, an exchange right. of ideas? And then we get almost immediately uh, a burst of social media. I mean, in terms of the, the range of history, we get this immediate social media comes into our lives and these private companies are allowed to ban people like Laura Loomer 
and Milo mm-hmm. and Alex Jones and so forth. And me. And you. I spent a day in jail. I spent a day in jail. Yes. I did. <laughs> Uh, and and have tiers of membership where there are blue check marks and not and so forth, and yeah. uh, and kind of control how people see uh, and and receive information from that site. And if you're not mm-hmm. aware that, for instance, Twitter is sending me posts regarding knitting, that's just that's just yeah. something they're doing. And included in that is advertisements that I might want to see. And uh, as long as it's funny, no, people don't complain about that. They've done lots and lots of polling about this because advertising people care about that's money, you know, that people care about the results of their advertising. They've done a ton of polling about direct mail and about pop up ads and all kinds of things. And how do people actually feel about it? If it is screened carefully enough to where it really is your interest to have that pop-up ad or that ad on Twitter or whatever it is, people don't mind. People don't mind if a yarn, I don't mind if a yarn ad pops up on my computer screen because I'm interested in that. Uh, And if you, if, if it's screened carefully, but the fact is it, it's not on the internet. (laughs) That's just not, it's not screened carefully. So, uh, but this control issue is interesting and, and how the public square talking really about you know the middle ages where there was a public square where people brought their cows and their corn and whatever it was they were selling on market day and everyone was there and you could exchange ideas and and gossip and share and see your neighbors and so forth that there really was this public time and public square where you would see and be seen and communicate yeah and at that time, there were actually community standards. You could not run around naked with cow poop all over yourself screaming murder. The com- Except for that one, that one day a year, the cow poop murder cow day. Poop- that <laughs> some, Somebody some, invented that. Some smaller Irish villages do celebrate <laughs> cow poop murder day. My people were talking Your people. about that. Other than that, <laughs> as a regular thing, we don't no, do it's that. it's not a regular right. thing. And so right. uh, here we have... Uh, Essentially, the equiv- certainly the equivalent of that with Alex Jones. Yeah. You know, someone who is willing to scream crazy shit to get attention. Uh, oh. and, and the hate speech, again, community standards, being able to yell Nazi slogans or uh, accuse people of uh, being not the right kind of Jew. <laughs> I mean, that's mm-hmm. these kind yep. of community standards. <clears throat> are not censorship. So, uh, and, and it is fascinating to me and other people have noticed this, that as you remove the platform, their ability to command attention diminishes the hate speech, diminishes the the message. They're not, Laura Loomer. It does. Handcuffing herself to the front door of the Twitter office was a joke for 12 hours. It wasn't. Yeah. Oh, free speech. Everyone needs to understand she needs her message needs to get out there. Her message is No, hate. she's like she's like the Rosa Parks of Twitter, honey. <laughs> really. She she no. She's whatever the opposite the of Rosa opposite Parks of is. That. That's and the fact that she yeah. put a yellow felt <laughs> star of David on her coat was yeah. offensive to people. It's not yes, it it's not uh her victimization. It's not her rights. It's not her free speech. She's a joke. So and and Milo being removed from Twitter, uh, all of a sudden he's not who he says he is. It when you take away the attention, mm-hmm. the message diminishes. There there is something to that, uh, and we need to do this with the Republican Party too. We, need, we really do. It, it's we, it's a much bigger project. A national joke, and. Because their ideas are terrible. And right now we're at, you know, Cold War with them. And we've got to get into this thing when Wisconsin and North Carolina, because this is so upsetting. Before we do that. Um, well, both sides. You know what? A little bit of victory. Both siderism is now a, a punchline. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Everywhere. Everywhere. So yeah. you, you, can, yeah. you can make a difference. And, um, and we, started only... that, we started that nine years ago next month. We did. We did. uh, Absolutely. You know, this is this we were early adopters and on our blogs much, much earlier mm -hmm. than that. But it was focus on this one thing. mm -hmm. 
focus on people who say this as a matter of reflex. You'll always find they have one of two characteristics. They're either coward centrists who don't want to take a side. They're, they're people in the media who, who want to play to both sides and, and profit from both sides and run a commercial enterprise that offends no one. Or they are Republicans who are hiding their past sins by pretending that everyone's as bad as they are. That's it's always the same. And, and there, in rare instances, is there an actual both sides do it thing that's legitimate to discuss. Very but it's rare. so rare that it becomes the exception. Uh, but my only warning is that these people will – the, the capitalist market will find a way to provide crazy people and hateful people with their drug of choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. They always will. Yeah. You know, the, the the idea that the Weekly Standard is about to be strip mined and gone the same week that Glenn Beck and Mark Levin team up is, I don't believe, coincidental. Right, right. It's that, look, you know, th you're so desperate for affirmation of your shitty ideology, you will climb into a dumpster with Glenn Beck to get yep. it. Yep. yep. And as as somebody wiser than me once said, I believe it was Spider Robinson, when he, he talked to a friend about, about porn shops back before Amazon, there were things called porn shops. Yep. He noted there were some kind of amazing things on the shelves, like dildos the size of artillery shells. And he asked the proprietor about them. And he goes, everything sells here, man. Wouldn't be on the shelf if it didn't right. sell. Everything in the store right. sells. The reason that these people make money is because there is a market for the hate they sell. And there is much, much less of a market for people who point at them and say, those people are the bad ones. We should stop them from doing that. Yeah, but and and the way the way you put that last night too, the the extended message behind that is that conservatism yes. is not an ideology; it's a market. It's a market for hate Absolutely. speech rather than here's our political philosophy that talks about limited government. That was what the Chardonnay people said to comfort themselves about their politics. Right. Uh, it that doesn't work anymore <laughs> because. No. Base is taken it over. Really did. I mean, right. The, the mask has been taken right. off the Republican Party, and now they see what we see. There, there was a response to Michael Gerson today on the Twitter from somebody who said, look, if you've lived in the South like I have and been a liberal in the South like I have, you've known this about the Republican Party your whole life. How do you not mm -hmm. know this? Mm -hmm. Well, Michael Gerson, who was a Republican policy advisor, a Republican uh, uh, pundit, and a speechwriter for George W. Bush. How did you not know it? And I did. And that is the question that will, again, that's the question that will never be asked because the answer is too terrifying and too destructive to the personal profits and psychological welfare of too many people with mm -hmm. too much power mm -hmm. and too much money. They don't want to answer that question because the answer is I was okay with going along with it as long as the people that it was fucking over weren't my neighbors, as long as they didn't do it in public, as long as they didn't elect Donald Trump, I was okay with all the shit they were doing. Right. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And now we're in a position where the Republican Party just declared open warfare on democracy. And that brings us to Michigan and Wisconsin right. and, and before and we Florida. get to that, I have two announcements to make. One is December 15th is the deadline for signing up for Obamacare. Uh Signups are yep. down this year, and we really want to get the message out that even if you have insurance that you're happy with, you should log on to to healthcare.gov, uh, insert your information, and see if you can save some money. Um, they, there is still uh, a marketplace. There is still uh, a way to get subsidies for your healthcare coverage. And uh, Drift Class and I, for the first time in our marriage, we've been married since 2011. Uh, we're able to mm -hmm. get uh, dental insurance. So uh, yes, pretty yeah. Impressive. So th so there is a, a reason to sign on. That's very important. Number two is Happy Zappadan. We want to talk about Zappadan for just a minute. Yes, Zappadan is yes. not only a <laughs> December holiday; it is a internet tradition of which we are aware. Uh, Frank Zappa was born and died in December. He was he died. December 4th, and he was born on December 21st, 1940, died December 4th, 1993. So from his death day mm -hmm. to his birthday, we celebrate Frank Zappa at Zappadan. And uh, mm -hmm. I, as the years have progressed, this has been going on for longer than the podcast. Literally since before he died. Yeah. So it was <laughs> no, weird that we predicted. Not, not since his, before no? he died, but... no. Uh, <laughs> But uh, since he died, but but it's been going on a long time. And it's uh, I love that it's kind of 
has its own mythos. You did a whole uh, the days of Zappadan and the first day of Bummer Knocked. You know, the, Bummer Knocked. The yeah. night that he died, the day he, that he died. There's uh, Titties and Beer Day. And mm-hmm. there's all kinds of days that are, are associated with Frank Zappa. As we've continued to uh, celebrate this year after year, every year I try to put a fresh take on it and I find out something more about Frank Zappa. And he was just an artist's artist, if you know. He really was. He really was. And uh, I love that about him. And every year when I go back and sort of look at, was he doing, he was doing music. He was uh, very much aware of the art scene around him and Mm -hmm. uh, didn't take any bullshit (laughs) from anybody. (laughs) But a free speech absolutist. Free speech absolutist. Um, Didn't want warning labels on uh, records because words are words. Would debate anyone, yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and about half his stuff, I never really appreciated as much as I could have. But all my nerd math major slash yeah. calculus slash jazz loving friends were like, dude, you don't understand how precise and elegant the music is. And I really, I never did. I mean, I, the, the, the Zappa stuff I like, I like. I liked him because my friends liked him. So I sort of appreciated him on that level. But I can appreciate how much I don't understand or, or can't really appreciate at the musical level, at the mathematical level, um, what he was doing with his art. But I can look back in awe at his body of work and the people that he impressed and the people that look at him and like, no, 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 he's the guy. Yep. This is the man. Yep. Um, and the, the fact that he stood for so many things that that we all agree with and, and fought for them and used his platform, used his public platform to fight for freedom and independence and and – Almost in a very uh, in a very nice way, a very libertarian point of view, a very, you know, live and let live. For God's sakes, let people do what they do and quit trying to protect the children from the harms of rock and roll and and sex. Because, because you're going to fail. You know what? <laughs> you're going to fail and you're fucking everything up. You know, if you want to go believe in God, go do that. But don't force me to believe in your God and don't murder me if I don't choose to do right. so. And I think that's a that's a wonderful message. I mean, that's a terrific – and the fact that he was so outspoken about it, uh, it makes him an admirable figure, and he should be on a postage stamp at some point. And if you really want to celebrate uh, Zappadam properly, you have to have at least one pancake breakfast uh? <laughs> uh, at some point during, during, the, mu- during, during the, the week the of Zappadam. Uh, and the celebration of Zappadam. Also, I didn't realize yeah. this is this year is uh, the 50th anniversary of Lumpy Gravy, and we're only in it for the money. 50 years. So yeah. wow. good for wow. them. All right. Happy Zappadan, everybody. Let's move on to uh, the bad news. This this is so depressing. <laughs> yeah. This is so it depressing is. because uh-huh. we were promised. <laughs> I feel like a jet whiny we white lady jet packs. now. I was yeah. promised yeah. a cake. But really, yeah. democracy promises us that if we uh, have a good message and work hard and win elections and actually win yeah. elections, that we'll yes. get power and that we'll be able to right. make the world a better place. That's the deal. Right. And the Wisconsin Republican Party and the Michigan Republican Party are uh, saying no to that and deciding that uh, the the old adage, the old Rush Limbaugh adage, we won, you lost to get over it, doesn't apply to them. And uh, they are attempting to take away power in the lame duck session from the incoming democratic governor and the incoming democratic attorney general in Wisconsin uh yep before they're inaugurated openly. permanently very openly they're and very, very open, open about, about it. it they they don't and they're very clear that we don't want them to right. govern and if you look and and this is another thing that that Digby um to her credit uh cited early and she's noted for it but Pretty much every liberal I know goes along with it, which is the idea the Democrats should never be allowed right, to govern, right. no matter right. what, uh, goes back yeah. to Clinton. Goes back to, you know, it, they were going to peach his, his ass the minute he put his hand on the Bible. There was no way they were going to let him govern as a Democrat. And it doesn't matter what you do. doesn't matter. And we've had now a quarter of a century of experimenting with how to deal with people like this. We had triangulation. We had uh, under Clinton, give them, you know, 75% of what they want. They're still going to come for your throat. They're still going to go after your family. They're still going to try to take you down. It doesn't matter what you do. Barack Obama, be the perfect president. 
be a gentleman, never raise your voice, have a perfect family, have a perfect record, give them their own health plan on a silver platter, give them anything they want, beg them to cooperate, and they're going to come and chop your legs off. We've now had enough of this experimenting with how do we appease Republicans? How do we coax them out of the crazy tree into civil conversation? It doesn't work. They don't believe we should ever govern anything because they don't believe the De- Democratic Party is a legitimate well, they governing body. They don't believe body. in democracy. They really don't believe in democracy. They don't believe in democracy. They and I, in as I said before, they clearly don't believe in elections. They don't believe that ballots actually mean anything unless it puts them in power. Well, and watching everybody from the, the gentleman on Policy of America to Paul Krugman catch up with my sentiment, which has been mine all along, and I don't own it, but it's certainly been in my heart for decades. Never underestimate how much conservatives right. hate this country. Right. right. Um, they love a white majority apartheid regime. That is their dream country, and they're they're willing to vote for anybody, including Donald Trump, who promises to deliver that to them. It used to be that, that you had to dress up that delivery system in a thousand points of light. <laughs> but that's always what they were voting for. In their hearts, they were always voting for a white majority, a white minority ruled country like South Africa. Yeah. That's their dream. Yeah. yeah. And now they just decided, screw it. Uh, we're up against the wall. Um, we're, we're becoming a minority that are, are not going to be able to hold on to power. So we're just going to nail into place our ability to control things from the minority, from the courts to screwing with the electoral politics of elections in Michigan and Wisconsin. And in Florida, we've decided that, you know, you all said that felons should be able to vote. Maybe not so much. Maybe we're just going to slow that down just a little bit. And in North Carolina, we're just going to steal votes, literally steal votes and write in people and deliver votes to the wrong address. And we're probably going to get away with it. Yeah. Um, North Carolina might have a new election, which would be great, and they should send in UN observers, which I think would be, would hilarious. be hilarious. But it would also but be necessary. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me about this taxing churches to help corporations. What's the story behind that? Yeah, it's it, it's it's uh, um, EJ Dion has a story in the Washington Post. Uh, the Republican tax plan, which uh, nobody likes and everyone hates. And it's a straight up gift to the wealthiest people in America that blows up the deficit. Just all the horrible things Republicans claim they hate for no net benefit to anybody but the rich uh, was so incompetently engineered that they managed to include sort of a phantom tax increase to people who work at at nonprofits mm-hmm. and in churches. Uh, it the, the, and they're trying to undo it, but it's that that degree of of incompetence, just sheer, stupid, slap this shit together, give them whatever they want, incompetence when it comes to writing tax policy has resulted in Republicans uh, taxing churches to pay for corporations. And I think that the Democratic Party would do well to make that their number one bill uh, in the new Congress. Number one, I believe, is going to be ethics. Number two is going to be voting rights. But in the top 10 somewhere, it should be the restore the church <laughs> to the hands of the good people act. Get take the church back from under the horrible Republican, Republican fuckers. Republican taxation of churches bill. <laughs> and this is this is something that, that you and I talked about too over the last couple of days. And if we could suggest to Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leadership one thing, it is the same thing I swear to you, I suggested to my liberal friends back in nineteen ninety two, three and four, which is learn from mm-hmm. Newt Gingrich. Don't become Newt Gingrich, but learn from Newt Gingrich. Democrats are going to have access to a bunch of microphones between now and, you know, whenever the 2020 elections begin, which is probably going to be four or five months. But Democrats are going to have access to more microphones. There won't be the majority because you're never allowed to have a majority of Democrats on any talk show anywhere. But Democrats are going to have access to microphones. And it's time to start saying we need to save this country from the racist Republican Party. I I tweeted that yesterday. The the racist Republican Party that has no respect for rule of law. At it again. Right. Here we go again. You know, use the Reagan line too. Here we go again. The racist Republican white supremacist party is trying to undo democracy once again. Every time you're a microphone, you need to say that. And every time you're asked a question on cable news, every time uh, uh, Chris Matthews or Chuck Todd or George Stephanopoulos ask you, but what about compromise? What about this? Throw the question back in their face. Well, how would you propose we compromise with a party of racist demagogues who hate America? <laughs> 
I mean, what's how would how how would that work exactly? They have no interest in compromise. They have no interest in governments. They're they're a criminal enterprise run by racists and lunatics. How would you suggest we compromise that? What what would you give away to people that are trying to destroy your country? There, George. What do you think we should give up for that? And make make them the issue. Make the people who put Republicans on the air the issue. Make them the bad guy. You know, you, you you're the people who keep putting Hugh Hewitt on the air, not me. I don't, don't understand don't why you do it. Don't forget to remind everyone that Mexico is going to pay for the wall, according right. to oh, yes, you know yes. the promises made, promises kept. Where's that promise yeah. that's going to be kept that Mexico is going to pay for the wall? Let's get to it. Every Democrat out there, make Mexico will pay for the wall your ringtone between now and the end of 2019. And every time anyone asks the question, just hold up your phone and play that and ta- take it up with President Stupid. This is, this his, is his promise, promise not, not mine. mine. Right, exactly. Uh, you have a note about Laura Ingram on our I do. Uh, podcast notes. Uh, she did yes, say the left probably likes child pornography better than they like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yes, she did. And she's still yeah. in the air for some reason. And, uh, but, yeah. but there's more to that story. Uh, this Really? There's more <laughs> to it? This week has been the return of the war on Christmas at Fox News. Are you surprised? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, there's an intern who's got the 24 seven job of making sure that any little story about any school district doing anything uh, to diminish the celebration of Jesus Christ's birth into the world uh, must be put on as an alert on Fox news primetime. Right. There yeah. was a, a bomb scare, a bomb threat, a credible bomb threat uh, that forced the evacuation of the CNN building on Thursday night. Uh-huh. Less than three hours before that bomb threat was phoned in, uh, Fox News had Carl Rove on and on a panel on the story with Martha McCallum, uh, where they played uh, Don Lemon on. They put Don Lemon's voice on their show talking about how he would not have shake shook Donald Trump's hand at the George H.W. Bush funeral. Uh, yes. What Don Lemon said, and I listened to it several times because Fox News played it, uh, what Don Lemon said was, isn't Barack Obama an amazing, gracious person that he shook hands with Donald Trump at George H.W. Bush's funeral? I'm not that good a person. I could not have done that. The Chiron yes. on the story with Marcia, Martha McCallum, which in which Carl Rove is on the par, on the panel, and they're all going to talk about how the media hates Donald Trump other than Fox, and how un-American it is to have so much disrespect for the president. The Chiron, while they were showing that, was Don Lemon wouldn't shake Donald Trump's hand. Mm-hmm. There is responsibility. I'm not going to say that a somebody that phones in a bomb threat saw that and directly went and phoned in a bomb threat to CNN. I don't know that. I can't make that connection, but they are responsible for their rhetoric and their lies. And that evening when Hannity's over and there, we know that there is a credible bomb threat at CNN. There is Laura Ingram. You know, there are crazy people out there. And we need to lower the temperature now. Let's lower the temperature because there are crazy. You know that guy who had the pipe bombs earlier? He was crazy. And he had that crazy van. And he was just crazy. And there are crazy people out there that will react to anything. And we just need to lower the temperature. And that was the end of her show. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the hypocrisy, (laughs) the turn on a dime when it actually uh, might cause someone to lose their life. Uh, and when when it's a credible threat, all of a sudden we're all going to support one another and to and lower the temperature. Uh, whereas earlier that day, look at Don Lemon and how much he hates the president of the United States was the Chiron. Yeah. And that's why a knowledge of history is terribly important, because mm-hmm. you can say just kidding only so many times. Yep. And if you look back on the long and filthy history of the modern Republican Party, it has been one long exercise in trying to push the envelope as far as possible into fascism. Absolutely. And And eliminationist rhetoric 
and uh, genocidal rhetoric. We saw that on Fox. This new Fox streaming service now has, you know, I I call her treadmill lobotomy. Uh, Tommy Laren actually using the same kind of language that the Nazis used about the caravan. They're diseased. They're going to invade. They're taking over. Uh, they'll take our place. And it is exactly the same kind of rhetoric that the Nazis used in 1937 against the Jews. It's absolutely not an accident. the same. It's not an accident. This is how it's not an accident. they're yeah. hired for this. They're put in seats in front of cameras to do this terrible thing by people who run Fox News. This is their business plan. And every so often, like when Timothy McVeigh blows up a building, right. they say, oh, we didn't mean that. That was, that was just crazy. That we never – just just because we've been telling you that the federal government is full of evil people who are trying to kill you and you should strike back at them at any way you can doesn't mean we really meant the federal government's full of evil people and you should strike back at them. And then, of course, once the smoke cleared and everything died down, they went right back to it. Yep. There's been no interruption in the steady – March, the steady goose step of the Republican Party into fascism during my lifetime. It's been going, it's a straight line. Once you start, it's really easy to slip right that for them to slip right down into that. Yep. You know, that Nazi eliminationist genocidal rhetoric. Well, that's the logic of their position. That's where it must end up. If you're if you're talking about if you spent the last 20 years talking about liberals as diseased, lying, America hating monsters who will stop at nothing to murder babies and overthrow the country and hand this over to terrorists, which is a compressed bullion cube of the Republican rhetoric during my adult lifetime. There's no there's no end point to this other than we have to get rid of them. And that's that's where they're going. This is where they're headed. And it's it is a, a, it is why people who operate the mainstream media are so terrified of looking backwards in any way because they don't want to draw the line the point to, the very clear straight line that's been going on for 50 years now and and look at where that line's headed they prefer to view history as little slices moments little slices of history that are floating out in the in the pellucid ether unrelated to anything else George W. Bush loved his children and his grandchildren and wrote th thank you letters. And yeah, great. Right. That's what it is. So, as someone said, that, so he wrote a thank you note and he had human grandchildren. That's great. He also pardoned a bunch of traitors on his way out of office. He also enabled the worst instincts of the right wing by hiring people who were terrible, who he knew were terrible. And this is the dirty secret. Once again, Everyone involved in this farce knows exactly who the Republican Party is. And the, uh, this is, again, another thing we were talking about the other day. The only two people, the only two groups who are honest about who the Republican Party base really is are people like Glenn Beck and us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who are, who are doing direct marketing to the ignorant, racist Republican base and people who are warning that the Republican Party, the base of the Republican Party are ignorant racists. Everyone else is pretending this isn't happening. It's not going on. It's some sort of fluke. It's just a one-off event or that it is somehow unrelated to history. This has all just happened last week, and it has nothing to do with what happened during the Obama administration or during the second Bush administration or during the Clinton administration going all the way back to Nixon and before. They, and that's the only way they survive because once you pull on that thread, it all unravels. You have to take responsibility for the entirety of the Republican Party's behavior for the last 50 years. And that means that every one of them has to never, ever be allowed in front of a microphone or a camera or in public office ever again. Mm -hmm. And they can't live with that. That is that is uh, Michael Gerson, for all of his I was so naive, I was so naive, isn't going to lose his job. Yeah. I don't I don't I've never worked in a place where you can be that big a fuck up for that long. And eventually, be forced into a corner where you have to admit you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, and you still get to keep your job. But that's what the media is. The media is a is a self-protecting, self-aggrandizing, narcissistic collection of careerists and climbers who don't want to start talking about the ugly truth that surrounds and them. The and the mistakes they've made. The, right. The real mistakes they've made. And, yeah. And the mistakes they've made and the ugly truth that's all around them is the reason we're here. The denial, the, their, their unwillingness to confront the problem when it was small and operable is the reason we have Donald Trump, a full-blown cancer on democracy. Because they wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't confront it. They wouldn't face it. And they wouldn't diagnose but it they correctly. Would, they would milk it for ratings. And they would. We, sure. we all remember the summer of 2016, the nonstop empty Trump podium waiting for Donald Trump to come out and give a speech.
And uh, they did that for ratings. Shall we move on to the news, or do you want to talk about Rex Tillerson confirming that Donald Trump Donald Trump replied about how Rex Tillerson's dumb as a rock, and we're so glad we have Mike Pompeo now because he's doing a great job. So, yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, what do you want? uh, And and it turns out uh, some senators are kind of mad about Crown Prince Bonesaw and, uh, you know, apparently uh, feel that Pompeo is is just being a good team player by going along with whatever – President Stupid and his 500 hotel rooms that the Saudis bought from him uh, Mm -hmm. has to say. And this is not just a corrupt president uh, violating the emoluments clause. This is a direct result of Citizens United. This whole thing, this whole thing with uh, Wisconsin. I mean, I wanted to ask the question, who is blackmailing these Republicans to do this? Because they're scared shitless. This is not just... We are going to grab power and we don't want Democrats to govern. They're being twisted, arm twisted to keep mm-hmm. power any way possible. They're getting phone calls from millionaires telling them, yep. I have too much invested for you to allow a governor to come in with a whole bunch of uh, environmental regulations. I don't have time for that. I pay, I pay you. What do I pay you for? And so make this happen yeah, but- so that he won't do that to me. If you'd like a practical guide to, to Republican politics, uh, we would both urge you to watch the final season of Daredevil. <laughs> yes. um, how uh, how an organized crime boss, you know, basically yeah. kills everybody or or uh, corrupts, corrupts everyone. 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 Corrupts everyone, gets leverage over everyone, everyone yeah. and you, you end up with people, you know, begging the good guys to stop investigating them because you don't understand. I need this job. You don't understand. I took out a loan. And you find out he's mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, where do you think the Koch brothers' money goes yeah. to? Yeah. It, goes it goes everywhere. everywhere. Where do you think where do you think Shelley Ilson's money goes to? These people are everywhere. They're into everything. And the idea that somehow some fucking state senator in Wisconsin wouldn't be responsive to a call from a billionaire saying, Look, let me be very clear about this. If you don't protect my interests, I will fuck you up and you will never work ever again. Your wife and children will die in poverty. Are we clear about that? I'm not saying that call was made or was put in exactly those terms. I'm sure there was a lot of yah hate airs in there so they could understand what they were talking about in Wisconsin. But <laughs> we love Wisconsin. the upshot Stop being it. That's a, it's a beautiful state. I want to go there again. It's a beautiful Visit. state. It's a lovely yep. state. It's 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 due north of here and, and we love it dearly. But the point being that the idea that the wealthy plutocrats who own the Republican Party and are really, really dependent on on being protected but the people that they bought and paid for wouldn't reach out and just squeeze their balls till they right, turn blue right. to get what they want because I paid for you. I bought you. I own you. And you're going to do what I tell you or I'm going to get rid of you and get some other clown in here is, is naive in the extreme. That's how power politics and crime works. And the idea that somehow that's not what – that this is some – again, some weird event that you couldn't possibly understand because – you know, who knows what their motives are? Why are they doing this? They're doing this because they're scared yep. to death. Yep. Because they are dependent entirely on billionaire money to fund their lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Why is Donald Trump shitting himself? Because he is owned by the Saudis and by the Russians and by God knows who else who are using him like a predator drone to wreck mm-hmm. our democracy. Mm-hmm. That's why. And, you know, I'm, I don't know what's provable in court. I don't know how, how deep into the records Mueller goes. We're recording this on Friday. We're sitting around basically twiddling our thumbs going, la, da, 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 da. Tonight, I predict, you know. It's, yeah. It yeah. just is. So. But the, my magic eight ball says all signs point to very, very bad right. things. Right. So and take that for what weekend. it's worth. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. Let's do a quick news roundup. Uh, the new U.S. ambassador to Canada says that when it comes to climate change, she believes in both sides of the science. Yeah, she's yeah. always said that. This is has she has she been confirmed by the Senate now? I, I don't. She, she doesn't have to be royal royalty doesn't need, doesn't need confirmation from the. Yeah, uh, FCC chairman admits that Russia meddled in net neutrality debate. Uh, around five hundred thousand comments were linked to Russian email addresses. Yeah. Yeah. This is the yep. week Donald Trump committed witness tampering and obstruction of justice right there on Twitter. Kellyanne Conway's husband <laughs> tweeted the witness tampering uh, statute <laughs> after Donald Trump praised Roger Stone for vowing to never testify against him. 
Uh, the next day, Roger Stone uh, basically is pleading the fifth for his documents. We will see how that goes. You actually cannot plead the fifth about documents. Uh, the no, documents will either be subpoenaed or not, but uh, you can't uh, plead the fifth about a document. You will, you can plead the fifth about your constitutional right to testify against yourself. Yep. And he is fully within his rights to do that. Documents have no rights. But that does not prevent him from going to jail if there is other evidence against him that is admissible in court. Okay. Again, if if you are a Democratic elected official and you're on a talk show and the subject of Roger Stone, the Fifth Amendment comes up, just pull out your handy dandy phone where you have recorded Donald Trump saying, people who plead the Fifth are scum. They're scum. Mobs just plead the Fifth. What sort of asshole pleads the Fifth Amendment? I just play that. Guilty people plead the Fifth. Amendment. Just yeah. play that for George yeah. Stephanopoulos. Say, what do you think, yeah. George? What do you think? I didn't say that. President Stupid said that. Take it up with him. This isn't my argument. I'd like to talk about health care. Mm-hmm. Because President Stupid needs a shiny object every time a bad thing happens, and because so many bad things happen so often, this week is the rumor that uh, Chief of Staff John Kelly is expected to resign his for post, real. which will be not, not for, for real. Yeah. For, for real. But, you know, I, we need to start th- lobbing more people on grenades. And they're running out of people to lob onto grenades. And the next next tier up from Kelly is Don Jr. and Jerry yeah, Devonka. So, you know, good luck with that, man. Yep. Uh, more Twitter meltdowns from the, Donald Trump this morning, but no mention of uh, Pearl Harbor Day. So, no. you know, why would he? Congress passed a two-week spending bill to extend the government funding through December 21st. I'm very old. I remember when Congress had passed budgets lasted a whole year. Um, <laughs> yeah. But apparently we just don't do that anymore. I wonder why, Lou Gal. I wonder what happened in our politics that the Republican Party can't seem to pass a fucking budget that lasts more than, I don't know, uh, Nixon's five o'clock shadow. I don't know. 67% of voters are concerned about recent climate change report that concludes that global warming is already transforming where and how we live. 58% agree with the scientific consensus that climate change is being caused by human activity. And in response, of course, to this immediate and existential crisis, uh, all the world's leaders of the G20 summit in Argentina, except for President Stupid, released a joint statement reaffirming their commitment to fighting climate change. Uh, what the Trump administration has done is propose loosening rules on carbon emissions for new coal plants and easing restrictions on oil and natural gas drilling because he wants to kill the planet before he mm-hmm. goes. Uh, an mm-hmm. undocumented immigrant has worked as a maid at the Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, since 2013, using fake documents to secure employment. And bless her uh, Michael heart, Flynn, she works very hard. And bless her, she does. She does. And and people like that, if they are removed from our economy, will cause our economy to collapse. Uh, Michael Flynn will serve no jail time because he's providing, quote, substantial assistance with a Russia probe, which means... Let's face it, he sang like Susan Boyle. He has he has given it all. Yeah, yeah. Trump traveled 250 yards in a limo as part of an eight-vehicle motorcade to visit with George W. Bush for 23 minutes across the street. Now, to be fair, yeah. the Secret Service probably required him to do that. Uh-huh. But uh, eight vehicles is a lot. It really, we reached the point of, of uh, well past the point of uh, Gerald Ford falling downstairs. Uh, everything... It does, you know, Donald Trump, you know, unable to close an, uh, an umbrella when he gets to the top of a staircase because he's too dumb and too tired and too distracted and too whatever. He just drops it because fuck it. I hate this job. Every little thing at this point is sort of uh, imploding well, yeah. on him. And, 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 and clearly at the funeral when he didn't sing and didn't read the uh, Apostles Creed, uh, he's blind. He cannot read things in front of him. Uh, he can't sign yeah. on the dotted line because he can't see it. And he's too vain to wear glasses in public. So, uh, And the number of publication headlines who praised him for not basically shitting on the pew and throwing himself yeah. on the coffin. Like, oh, for 20 minutes he behaved like a person. A shitty person, a, a petulant little child, but at least he didn't scream and set his hair on fire. So, hey, maybe this pivot's finally coming. You know, this is the best infrastructure mm-hmm. week yet so mm-hmm. far, Blue Gal. Uh, new satellite images reveal, oh, no, North Korea has expanded. It's long-range no missile base. Not contracted, not given up. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, Saudi-funded lobbyists booked 500 hotel rooms at Trump's D.C. hotel shortly after his 2016 election. They sent military uh-huh. veterans to Washington to have them lobby against a law the Saudis proposed, opposed, 
Um, the lobbyists spent more than $270,000 on six groups of visiting veterans at the Trump Hotel. And the veterans uh, who were interviewed by the Washington Post uh, noticed and were told by congressional staffers, oh, are you the vets that are being bribed by the Saudis to be here? <laughs> now, here's my only disappointment mm-hmm. with this story, Blue Gal, that it wasn't twice as big. Because then you would have a thousand one Saudi That's Arabian right. nights. That's right. Yeah. Of the, yeah, that mm-hmm. would have made it perfect. But I guarantee you out there, there's enough more emolument oh, yeah. clause violations, Absolutely. much more of pocket filling um, to, to impeach nine presidents, frankly. Uh, but Donald Trump said he isn't worried about anything. He's especially not worried about the national debt because, quote, I won't be here, unquote, when America has to pay his credit. Well, and back. why would I'll he? Be gone, you'll he be gone. lost money as a casino owner. So he's not. Right. <laughs> of course, he's going to say, I'll be gone. You'll be gone. He's he's based his whole career on that. Well, and and those of you with long memories might recall that during the campaign, when asked about what to do about, he said, well, declare bankruptcy. Yeah, right. You know, it's easy. You just you, you tell your creditors you're going to pay them a dime on the dollar. You know, I did it four times. It works great. And someone had to take, you know, crazy Uncle Liberty aside and say, America can't declare right. bankruptcy. That doesn't work. We're not like a, we're not a, we're not a sleazy real estate developer and, and failed casino owner. We're actually a nation state. And we're the one of the biggest in the world, and we are the world's reserve currency, and we can't fucking declare bankruptcy to get out from under our bad debts, you asshole. And it, but it doesn't occur to him that that's not possible because that's how he's gotten out of everything. So at this point, well, I don't care. Fuck it, I don't care. I'm not going to be here. What do I? What do I care about future generations? Says Donald Trump and 60 million Republicans. That's the campaign slogan we should be running on in 2020, blue gal. Fuck the future. The future. <laughs> Republican Party. Fuck the future. Fuck says fuck the future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the White House wants to end federal subsidies and tax credits for electric cars and renewable energy sources, as they are making it easier for coal and oil and gas and companies to blow And who is paying them to apart. do this? Let's ask the question. Uh, what a good question. Rudy Giuliani had a hilarious typo on Twitter <laughs> and then bitched about it again on Twitter that yeah. someone had invaded yeah. his text with a disgusting anti-president message. And uh, that yeah. person, whoever they are, is now adding links to uh, the Reddit page of the Trump Russia investigation, to uh, Rudy Giuliani's link that he provided in his tweet. Uh, Trump used Air Force One to campaign for Republican candidates during the midterms. It cost the taxpayer around seventeen million dollars. Now, presidents are supposed to use uh, using Air Force One for campaigns are supposed to pay, pay for a portion of it, so they pay back a part of it. Thus far, the Trump campaign has reimbursed the Treasury roughly one hundred and twelve thousand dollars for air out travel. of seventeen million. Out of seventeen million, because he's a cheap, sleazy scumbag, and he always will be. Yep. And we know from last week the Trump organization wanted to give Vladimir Putin a fifty million dollar penthouse. Because why not? You know, each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week we have not a kitty but a bearded dragon named Pancake, (gasps) which is totally appropriate for (laughs) Zappadan. St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast, where he stole the margarine, uh, is uh, a Frank Zappa song, St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast. Yes. Check it out. Uh, So the bearded dragon Pancake is our internet pet of the week, and you can visit Pancake at our Facebook page and website. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And Drift Glass, we have received uh, six coffees at Buy Me a Coffee this week. So uh, it wasn't a total failure. And I want to thank those people. There were five people. One person bought us two coffees. And one one person is buying each of us a coffee every month, which is an option. So Buy Me a Coffee is one of the options at our website. Um, It's a new website. That doesn't use PayPal. They use Stripe uh, for their charges. And uh, you can buy us a coffee once a month or one time. 
Uh, and we, as I said last week, we we agreed to participate on this, and because we have all these fake advertisers and a gourmet coffee guideline, I think people thought it was fake at first, but it's not. Um, no, we're fake. The gourmet coffee uh, giving method is real. So. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, approximately, and we've done the math now, approximately one half of 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. And you can too. And we want to thank you. Can. You are in the one half of 1% of our listeners. We appreciate you so much. See our website, proleftpod.com for details. Our PayPal postal address information uh, as of this afternoon, Friday, we will have a new GoFundMe, which is only going to run through the end of this year to help me pay my medical bills. That's on there. And uh, it's all there at ProLeftPod.com. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you for doing that. So, Blue Gal, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? The Internet Kitties comments have been redacted. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.